Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome from me. My name is Hans-Peter Hinrichsen. I'm the deputy head of mission here at the embassy. Welcome you here. I always and also welcome our viewers that are online, Europe Calling, the Charles University, and the German Society for Eastern Policy are all streaming this event so that we do have many more listeners and viewers than in this room here. I'm standing here with a book in my hand, and this belongs to the history of this event, because this is an event that we have had planned for a very long time, for over a year now. We wanted to have it last year already to present that book, which is a publication by the um, Deutsche Gesellschaft für Osteuropakunde, German Society for Eastern Europe Studies, and this is a volume dealing with the Czech Republic. It was already presented in Berlin at the Czech Embassy, and we thought it was a good idea to present it here. But after a second thought, we thought it was mainly written for German readers, people who don't know much about the Czech Republic. So presenting it here would not be the right audience. It's something that we call in German, Eulen nach Atentrang, or preaching to the converted people who know already. So we thought, let's do something together that tackles current issues. So we thought, which topics are the most important ones? And there's one for sure that is security. We have a closer security cooperation. We have the 24th of February, so this year, we have a war going on in Europe. So that's for certain is one of the two most important topics also in our bilateral relations. And the other one is following from that energy. We have a Czech delegation going to Berlin this week to talk about energy terminals, energy supply. They're the constant line of communication between the capitals. So I'm very happy that we do have two panels this evening to discuss these two topics, security and energy. So I would like to um, call the participants of the first panel to uh, come to the front. And I'm looking for the moderator of the first panel. Here she is. And I would pass the floor to you. Thanks very much. And thank you all for being here this evening. Thanks very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Susanna Lestseva. I'm the head of a German and Austrian Studies Department at the Charles University in Prague. And the reason why I'm here today is uh, that uh, many authors of uh, our university took part uh, in producing the volume you've already seen uh, a few moments ago. And uh, a great colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Vladimir Handel, was one of the editors of the volume. Uh, so I have the uh, honor to chair the first panel for today. We will talk about security in times of war. And let me introduce my panelists. Uh, the first one is uh, Jan Jeresh, uh, Czech uh, Deputy Minister of Defense. Uh, on his left side, Jakub Eberle. He's the Director of Research uh, in uh, the Institute of, of Foreign Relations. And uh, the third panelist is Kai Olaf Lang from uh, the Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin. We will start with a short introductory round, and after that, I will open the discussion uh, for your questions and also for the questions uh, from our online audience. So let me please uh, start with Mr. Yiddish. Uh, would you be so kind to tell us uh, in a few minutes which were the three main lessons learned by the Czech Republic after the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Well, many thanks, first of all, many thanks for the invitation. Uh, also, this might be an unusual sight for you because I guess most of you have forgotten about people wearing face masks. 
Um, actually, I'm sort of unwell. I have tested three times negative for COVID over the past three days, so it's not COVID, but still have I still I have some nasty infection. I don't want to spread uh, in these halls, so that's why. That's why. Um, and it also means that actually, because I am sort of dizzy, <laughs> slightly and wary, I will have even less inhibitions than usually. So. I suppose uh, uh, the discussion will benefit from my illness. Um, okay, you asked for three main lessons learned uh, from the war in Ukraine. Please let's not not call it conflict or uh, let's not use some other euphemisms. It's just a brutal aggression. It's a war of aggression against a peaceful neighbor. So it's a war in Ukraine. It's not conflict in Ukraine. Um, so yes, I have three uh, lessons learned that I believe that actually are most relevant for uh, defense and security. I will try to avoid discussing uh, energy, even though, of course, uh, many of it is uh, related to energy issues and some other areas of security, because, of course, these days uh, uh, security is a broad term uh, which interlinks many different areas, including energy. And you cannot avoid actually talking about energy and other stuff uh, when discussing uh, European or global uh, strategic uh, relations. But uh, first, uh, when it comes to defense policy and military issues, um, I think the main lesson learned from the war in Ukraine so far has been how extremely materially uh, demanding uh, a modern war with peer, adver with peer adversary is and would be, which of course is a major lesson learned for NATO and NATO member countries. Uh, and of course we have uh, neglected uh, this aspect of uh, modern warfare over the past couple of decades. And actually we believed that uh, uh, wars would be won by uh, you know, typing uh, on the keyboard or clicking the mouse, uh, which uh, I'm not saying that actually is not relevant, but we also see that a real contemporary war is highly materially demanding. So if there is at any point uh, in the future uh, an operation of collective defense conducted by NATO, we can be quite sure that uh, uh, we need to do our homework first in the sense of uh, expanding our stockpiles of military equipment uh, and military material of all kinds, especially ammunition, because this is what we see in Ukraine every single day, how crucial it is to have uh, an access to sufficient stockpiles of military material, as well as access to production capacities that actually can at any point uh, to supply us with uh, what we need to wage a war against peer adversary. So that's uh, one lesson learned, uh, let's say a very practical one on the defense policy and military level. Uh, then my second lesson learned, uh, which is relevant to European politics or to balance of power on the European level. Um, it has been much spoken about already, about uh, uh, the fact that uh, the different reaction of different European countries to the Russian aggression in Ukraine actually uh, is leading to, a, to, to some shifts in European balance of power. Uh, Yes, uh, of course, we like we like this uh, uh, this stream of 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 of, of discussion. Um, uh, we truly believe that uh, uh, when it comes to strategic uh, relations within Europe, uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe will have much greater say when it comes to defense and security in Europe uh, uh, over the next uh, years uh, because of how we have been able to react. Uh, uh, to Russian aggression uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, frankly speaking, no European country, no matter how big it is, has proved to be able of a true leadership in the European Union. Uh, uh, just let me give uh, you uh, an example 
you would like actually because uh, this is a safe ground i will slander the french uh uh french uh, host for decades and decades as european leader in nuclear both when it comes to uh, military use and civilian use uh and actually now in the minute of the greatest peril uh to european security we discovered that uh, the French actually invested in their nuclear power plant so little that actually they need, needed to close half of them uh, because they neglected uh, maintenance. Okay, this this is how a supposed leader in nuclear energy production behaves. It's ridiculous. Uh, so uh, I've heard uh, somebody saying a joke that uh, there are two types of countries in Europe. One type uh, is countries that are small, and the other type of country of European countries is countries that uh, still do not realize they are small. Mm -hmm. um, so this needs to be taken into account. And uh, given how we have actually managed to contribute to Ukraine, Ukraine's defense, as well as how to assist uh, Ukrainians fleeing the war, I think we, meaning Central and Eastern Europeans, have really set uh, a gold standard in Europe. Uh, and I think we won't let anyone lecture us again on anything. Uh, when it comes to the proportion of population, the Czech Republic is hosting the highest number of Ukrainian refugees of all the countries around the globe. So I think that uh, uh, one one product of this will be a much higher level of self-confidence we will have in European relations, and we will not uh, let anybody lecture us again. Um, also, uh, okay, uh, um, it's not enough that a, uh, a head of government uh, uh, actually uh, speaks nicely and cleverly uh, in the parliament, uh, uh, what is needed is action. So, of course, we are and will be carefully following uh, development on the ground in Germany, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, there is no automatic, you know, place for just saying things. We will need for uh, concrete actions uh, and steps to be taken uh, on the ground. And only after that, when we, meaning the rest of Europe, uh, see that um, uh, really what uh, Chancellor Scholz uh, said uh, in late uh, February is being implemented in practice, then Germany will be trusted uh, as uh, one of the European leaders in defense and security. Uh, simply words are no longer uh, enough. Uh, we need to see practical action. And my third uh, lesson learned, uh, which is relevant uh, uh, for the global level, is that the United States engagement in European defense and security is still indispensable, of course. Uh, without US leadership and engagement and involvement, Ukraine would have probably been defeated in spring this year. Uh, so, what is the European Union's main role in defense and security? I would say enable NATO collective defense in the first place. So, of course, we know that modern collective defense requires many things. Uh, much of uh, uh, those uh, uh, are not strictly military. And, of course, I admit that the European Union has so many uh, useful tools to enable uh, collective defense and security uh, in, in any kind of contemporary conflict. So yes, uh, EU's uh, instruments and capabilities must be harnessed to enable collective defense in a NATO. So at the global level, um, Is this for a part of the US uh, political elite just a distraction from focusing uh, on China? Uh, well, yes, apparently there are a few people, especially in the Republican Party, who believe, uh, who believe so. Um, we must, of course, uh, prevent uh, from this happening so that actually at some point uh, uh, somebody in the United States uh, will say, okay, that was enough. 
uh, uh, European security must be uh, handled uh, uh, exclusively by Europeans. We need to refocus on China again. And to prevent uh, such a shift, uh, we really finally need to come to a real and credible new transatlantic bargain uh, that would uh, actually involve uh, ways of how Europe can and will be helping and assisting the United States around the globe so that actually the Atlantic Alliance really is uh, uh, seen as uh, mutually uh, advantageous and actually as, a, as, as something that uh, uh, from uh, that, that, that both sides of the Atlantic uh, benefit from. Uh, so that, that that was my third uh, major lesson learned from the war in Ukraine, uh, simply the need for finally defining the new transatlantic bargain that would both uh, cover uh, defense and security of Europe, including uh, massive, you know, and continuing US engagement, uh, as well as uh, European role in global affairs in order to support uh, the United States in places outside of Europe. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeresh. Uh, Kai Olaf, hearing that, uh, would you say the German lessons learned are the same or similar or very different from the Czech ones? Thank you, Susanna. Thank you for the invitation. I think at the very beginning, I would like to um, remind us all that we are in a, still in a process of learning. So, of course, uh, some dreams have been shattered and, of course, some illusions have disappeared and some conclusions have been drawn. But in many, in many respects, we are still in a process where we have to reorient um, ourselves, especially especially in Germany, and you alluded to, to that. I think I, I would I would uh, emphasize three three developments, or uh, I'm I'm not completely sure if these are lessons learned, but certainly um, uh, experiences of 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 what has been going on since February the uh, the second in Germany. Uh, the first the first development, of course, is we have been witnessing a massive return of securitization. Um, securitization is, is a concept in political sciences, but securitization is something which in the last years in Germany and the European Union has been rather vague and multifaceted, and it was rather at the soft end of the, of the um, uh, spectrum, whereas now we saw the god of war is back in Europe. And Germany, even though it is not a frontline state, uh, is directly involved as a country in the middle of Europe, as a systemic country for Europe's security uh, in, in the war and in tackling Russia's um, aggression. I think Germany has clearly seen, and it is true, a speech of uh, the head of government is not enough, and even 100 um, billion euros does not make the big uh, the big turn. But that's these are necessary preconditions, not necessarily sufficient one, but these are these are necessary in order to um, to change. Uh, Germany, will, I think, is on on the way where it sees. Um, as a as a civilian power, as a Handelsstaat, uh, a Handelsstaat alone or the the modus operandi of a Handelsstaat is not sufficient, and that's why we have to open up to uh, the sphere of of hard power. And I think in the mindset of the political elites and of the leadership, at least in the so-called mainstream, uh, this lesson has been learned. However, of course, as you rightly said, it's a very broad <laughs> process. And I think uh, society, still, the, 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 uh, an enduring acceptance in the German society for the Zeitenwender has to be ensured. So I think we're in, in, this, in this process of a, of a realignment in, uh, in German um, uh, security, and uh, to put it in, in, in a more in, in a broad way, uh, the German uh, strategic culture was used to live in a world of uh, of punt, 
Yeah, and uh, the uh, German-American uh, political scientist Alexander Wendt said there, uh, once said there are three security um, traditions or cultures. One is around uh, hunt, so we 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 are surrounded by friends, and we have to organize the anarchy of the international system in uh, by, by rules. And in the last years, I think that's very kind of embedded in the German foreign policy DNA. Germany also noticed that the second culture of rent, the one of, of, of luck, the one of rivalry has become stronger. But now we're in the world of Hobbes, where we have enmity and, and, and war. That's, I think, this, this uh, shift in the strategic culture is so difficult because we come from the from the other hand. And here probably countries like Poland, the Baltic states, I'm not so sure about the Czech Republic. Um, uh, at least about the elites, but I think in terms of the societies, our countries are, are not so far away. Um, but, but countries from Central Europe, Southeastern Europe, have a comparative advantage in this in this um, in this process. Um, second second observation. Um, uh, uh, I think what we have learned is, of course, the, the unity of the European Union, as it is often said, is uh, an asset uh, in order to to tackle uh, aggressions, uh, to tackle also to respond to to the war. That's what we saw also with in con the context of, of sanctions, for example. Uh, consensus is an important resource. Uh, and even if there are some countries which sometimes uh, take more time uh, to consent, you can say the EU was able to even convince them. So it's an even stronger signal to the outside to the outside world. But I think uh, what the conflict also, not only the conflict and the war is shown, uh, but I think one of the lessons is that um, the EU uh, action uh, it has to focus on effectiveness. You know, the EU has not always to be uh, united. That's the, of course, the desired option. But the, the most important um, priority should be to organize effective external action. So if you take an initiative like the European Sky Shield, irrespective of the, of the future fate of that, I think no one discussed so much what the a place is what the institutional framework is where this has to be anchored. It's just an initiative uh, uh, sponsored by uh, by uh, by um, European states, and it's important that this process will uh, will go on. So maybe we should think more about the results and the effectiveness than about um, uh, procedures. Uh, and uh, and finally, of course, uh, that's a German story. Uh, the third, the third um, effect of the war uh, on the conceptual level, uh, Germany, uh, which we all know, has for many years uh, practiced a certain form of, of Ostpolitik, uh, which I think was in a process of change. Uh, long before uh, the war, step by step. So the old paradigms of, of, of well, not only Russia first, but Russia only have not existed in its pure form in the last years. Germany has discovered the relevance of Ukraine, maybe not sufficiently. Uh, Germany has accepted a process of association, which in the middle of the last decade, I remember debates in Berlin after the Orange Revolution was a no-go no for, for Germany. So step by step, I think there was a change. But this uh, now, together with a couple of basic uh, paradigms of German foreign policy, like Inter interdependence and mutually mutually mutual dependence generates stability yeah? and interdependence might even spark a change this has of course definitely gone right now so um we are think i think there is still no clear concept about what to do in the east i mean the czech republic Poland have, I think, 
a more uh, clear, uh, a, a, a clearer perhaps vision about what containment means, what uh, uh, hedging malevolent Russian influence means, uh, than in Germany, which uh, yeah, it stands uh, on the rests of its of its Eastern policy. This is, I think, an opportunity, an opportunity in the German Czech dialogue, in the dialogue of, of Germany. And, and and Central Europe, but I think, uh, but I suppose uh, Jakub will, will talk uh, about this a bit. Um, Germany needs uh, countries from Central Eastern Europe, which of course are critical, but which are constructive at the same time. That's not the case in uh, if we, for example, look at, 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 at Poland, uh, where of course some legitimate arguments are put forward, but where we are in the moment not able to develop a sort of constructive cooperative a cooperative agenda of the two countries within the EU or within within NATO. So I think the Czech Republic to some extent could could help Germany with its um, uh, pragmatic voice in security and European affairs. Thank you very much, Kai Olaf. Uh, Jakub, I would be curious about your point of view. Uh, what do you think are the most disputed topics uh, in the Czech German security relations? And maybe is there something we do and neglect over time? Thank you, Susanna. I'm quite curious to what I'm going to say because uh, I've heard two, two very well prepared speeches from both sides. I mean, it's up to me to draw my notes kind of, kind of together, right? So we'll see where that, where that takes us. I think what is quite an interesting starting point, right? That there's this kind of assumption, which is not entirely wrong, right? That uh, Ukraine, the aggressive war in Ukraine, I agree with that, uh, has been kind of a star moment for Czech diplomacy after a while where we kind of missed such, right? Whereas uh, it has not really been a star moment for Germany. Uh, at the same time, I think that like, you know, if you put these two countries next to each other, these are not the European extremes, even though I would put both in the camps of like, you know, perhaps like, you know, the star shining up and the one where, you know, there's a more reluctant picture. But then again, it depends, like, what is your expectation? The one thing that I find quite problematic in the Czech debate about Germany is that we're often measuring Germany compared to how we would like it to be, not compared to both countries that would perhaps make a relevant comparison. You already mentioned France, right? France, half of per capita support of Ukraine compared with Germany, right? France is something that I would always kind of consider a benchmark for seeing German policies. So Germany clearly outperforms France. So Germany is not that bad as would sometimes come up from the Czech debate. Let me go into some of the, some of the I think, outcomes from this. You mentioned lecturing. We won't get ourselves lectured. Well, why would we, like, you know, why would we have ever gotten ourselves lectured within the EU, right? So the point about some sort of a missing confidence is a, is a real problem, right? But there's also the temptation, you know, within the EU, which was sadly seen also during, during the, the war on Ukraine to lecture others. And I think lecturing on the EU is best avoided as a, as a general practice. And I think it doesn't really, really serve, serve well among the lies. The other thing is, what we kind of share, I think, the Czechs and Germans, is the certain tendency for sometimes strategic, sometimes intuitive self marginalization right? So, you know, so the Czechs have surprised ourselves, you know, for being, being good for once. I mean, why aren't we more self-confident and proactive as a matter, as a matter of, you know, routine? And with Germany, you know, you, I have to see that there is a problematic streak that comes from, on the one hand, talking about Zeitenwende, which in any way is more a slogan and less of a strategy. And then when you hear, I think it was uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, you know, Schultz's uh, right hand man talking about, oh, we're just a teenager in security affairs. You have to be patient with us. 
How long is it since Gerhard Schroeder was talking about Germany being a grown-up adult, being able to step up with the big ones? 20 years, 25 years? So I think that this kind of discourse of you know, self-marginalization, perhaps with some sort of, you know, self, some sort of exceptionalism reserved for the self is not helpful either. So I think that's something that would, you know, be better avoided in the, in the, in the debate. Um, one thing that I find quite, quite bitter actually as an experience, there's a lot of, a lot of good stuff I'll be talking about that, but as a bitter experience is, the kind of lack of emphasis, and Kai talked about it a little bit, on actually holding the European or Western thing together. That very often, you know, there seems to be outrages about, you know, highly publicized outrages about whom it took three or four more days to agree to a sanction package, you know, and then you end up, then the things get in, and you on to yet another disappointment. I don't think this is very helpful. But unfortunately, that's a way of how perhaps diplomacy is sometimes being done in the age of kind of over exposure and, and virtue signaling. And again, I think we've seen this in many previous European crises with different kind of division lines in Europe and different more asymmetries than we have, than we have right now. What I also find better is, and now I'm going to the Czech German thing more explicitly, the lack of empathy and even understanding between the two countries. The one thing is that clearly, and it's getting better, and despite the efforts of people like Kai Olaf or Volker, you really see that the knowledge of the region, you know, if you take out, Orban is bad, Poland is bad, among journalists, politicians, even journalists, even the debate is not great, to put it, to put it mildly. At the same time, you know, there are many established journalists in Czechia who repeatedly write critical German bashing articles based on The Economist, who don't speak German at all. So perhaps this kind of lack of knowledge on both sides sometimes doesn't really help. So, you know, the long term, so which is obviously to develop it, the short term perhaps practice some self-reflection and self-restraint. And I think this was also like the examples in the Czech German German relationships on both sides that would be better better really attended to. Uh, where I see quite a lot of common ground, where I didn't say, where I, I started by saying that I don't think we're really both apart in many things, despite notable, notable differences, and despite the extent of support of support of Ukraine, for example, in things. But one of them, and uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy Iresh mentioned that, is uh, NATO as indispensable. I mean, one of obviously the causes of Schultz not being that friendly with Macron later is that obviously Macron has different ideas about like, you know, building up, for example, European weapons rather than buying American, right? Different ideas how to spend the defense money than how to building, building sky shields covering for, for large extent Central and Eastern Europe. So there is, there is, and there is, you know, we, we're not that close apart again on this, even though Czech Atlanticism is definitely stronger than German one. But Germans are still, you know, quite Atlanticist in this, in this extent. And we also face similar challenges. Don't forget that you know, Czechia's military spending is, you know, compared to GDP, about the same size as Germany, actually a little bit lower. The projection of the growth is similarly <coughs> going there, and we even want to acquire some similar technologies, F-35, in the, in the first, first place. And one of the good things is that perhaps we're starting some functional cooperation in security and defense above and beyond what was the norm. So there, I think, are some convergencies. And I think that these convergencies, I mean, and I, been saying that often since the war started. Perhaps one lesson that we as allies in Europe should relearn is really this definition of diplomacy as a kind of management of differences, not as kind of lecturing, virtue signaling, overplaying of, you know, who is momentarily better in something. And I think in that spirit, what of what has been done could be could be learned upon and uh, and utilize to push some of some of the good stuff that's been happening forward thank you
Many thanks, Jakub. Uh, many interesting points uh, were mentioned within the framework of this really complex uh, situation. Uh, now uh, we have the time for uh, your questions. And uh, if you are curious to hear something from our panelists, please raise your hand and introduce yourself. And you can also address uh, the question to one concrete panelist. Yes, please. Thank you very much for the very interesting panel. Uh, I have a question to this uh, the piece and to try all us um, concerning the perception of the war and then the war, our aims in supporting Ukraine. How how important? Obviously, we have the same ground, sort of same same same, same general understanding of the conflict. Um, how important is it? Is it that the German side? Chancellor never says Russia should be defeated and Ukraine should be should should win the war. And how important is it that the Czech side is rather explicit in supporting the victory of Ukraine? Uh, is it just uh, sort of uh, political rhetorics, or is it uh, something what we really have to talk about and have to find ways how to? meet both sort of uh, ways and then de 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 define common position. Second question is on the arms production. And it is obviously, as Jakub mentioned, the you know, buying from the shelf is, of course, a very practical uh, way forward uh, uh, in uh, dealing with the deficit, deficits which we both have. Uh, where is the, what, what do you expect to be the next sort of steps? We still need to go also the French way, sort of developing European uh, arms production. Do you see the, 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 this dimension, the European dimension of the arms production um, and, uh, and how these two our countries could cooperate, not only on this, as I say, practical issues of buying on the shelf, but from the shelf, but also developing uh, arms and, um, and, and arms production. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's start with the first question, the victory of Ukraine. Well, uh, we play different roles of course, on this stage. So uh, I am not able to free, freely analyze, you know, uh, what you asked about. Uh, it's more up to Jakub actually to, to dive into dissecting actually what we really believe and what is, is what, what the government is saying is actually grounded in the, you know, the, the, the uh, in reality or something. Uh, I, I can't possibly, uh, you know, do that, uh, uh, especially when I know that this actually is doomed. Uh, but when it comes to our war aims, or how to put it, uh, I would uh, say ju just two things. First, uh, I think we and the government, and I would say that still the, a solid majority of the population believe that independent, free, secure and stable Ukraine is crucial for our own security and independence, at least when it comes to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. I'm not sure whether other countries for the West, starting with Germany and concluding with Portugal, feel the same, obviously not. And the reasons are obvious, you know, starting with geography. Uh, but at least for us in Central and Eastern Europe, this is very clear. And this is something that, of course, is not new. This has been spoken about by Zbigniew Brzezinski for 30 years, that independent and sovereign Ukraine is key for uh, Central European security, stability, independence, and freedom. So that's one thing. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is that we, and the government, I'm sure, and still, I would again say, the majority of Czech population believe that um, if Russia, as an aggressive, neo-fascist, expansionist regime, <laughs> is not stopped in Ukraine, it will go for the West. As simple as that. So, in this sense, I know that I mean, for some people, that has already this has already turned into sort of uh, 
a slogan that they uh, that they make fun of. But in this sense, Ukrainians are cruel fighting for us because without them fighting back, uh, we firmly believe that uh, Russia would militarily threaten in one way or, or another uh, countries for the rest, including potentially uh, some NATO, some NATO allies. And actually, before it started this aggression in Ukraine, Russia used many different ways on many different occasions to keep testing the resolve of NATO, NATO allies, and uh, the sort of the credibility uh, of uh, NATO uh, collective deterrence and defense. So Russia was doing that for years, of course, mostly using all kinds of uh, non-military hybrid, uh, you know, methods and tactics. Uh, but as I said, uh, without Ukrainians fighting back and fighting back so vigorously and admirably, um, uh, Russia would be emboldened even more than before and actually probably would try to test us, meaning uh, NATO's resolve and NATO's unity and the credibility of NATO's collective defense would be ready and willing to test that, all that even more than it than uh, what it was doing before February 2022. So, uh, so Ukrainian uh, defense is really crucial for our security or on the very practical, everyday level. That's what I would say. Thank you. Can I produce so the German perception is the same? I would say in principle, the German political class and the majority of the society and public opinion accepts the importance and the necessity of uh, the support of Ukraine and the support and the existence of or the, the support for an independent Ukraine, which is able to decide about its fate and so on and so forth. Otherwise, Germany would not have acted in the way it did in the last months. Uh, I think there is also a majority which thinks Russia should not win, but the notion of a victory or a defeat is relative. Mm -hmm. So um, a victory is what the winning side defines as a victory very often. And the same thing is with a defeat on the other way, on the other way around. So of course, the first it, it's Ukraine which has to decide when it has when it has won, yeah, and when when it has achieved its, its goals, and not and not us. Um, the, the, the challenge I see in Germany is that there is still that, of course, that there is a debate about um, what is the price we have to pay for Ukrainian success and moreover there is a deeply rooted fear of escalation and collapse uh, remember uh, this uh, summer when ukraine had success military on the, on the on the ground military successes one after the other i think in germany and also in some other states there was a feeling that and um, if the Ukrainians are too successful and, and the Russian front implodes, and this might have, then Russia might resort to very irrational, so to say, means. So collapse as the other way of doing escalation. So I think that's that's something which at some points comes into play for the equation, how Germany behaves in the um, in, in that uh, in that story. One. Um, but I think uh, all in all, uh, to use the word of, of, of John Raggi, he, he says there are uh, configurative wars. This war is existential for Ukraine, but it also determines the outcome, will determine about the order of, of Europe. And, and I think this awareness is clearly, clearly uh, embedded in, uh, in the German debate and in the German political um, foreign policy establishment. One brief um comment on on on, on Jakub in the Germany and the Czech the Czech uh, Republic um I I have sometimes the the uh, the impression if you look at each other that um positively um 
for, uh, for, for many in the Czech Republic, Germany is the better France. And for some in Germany, at least those who look at the region, the Czech Republic is the better Poland. And maybe we should try to, to, overcome, to overcome that and uh, think about a more active profilation of our relationships. But I think the, one of the pillars of, of future German-Czech initiatives might be a narrative uh, of uh, we are the standard bearers of Euro-Atlanticism. So yes, strong bonds, strong transatlantic ties are uh, uh, the conditio sine qua non for security in Europe. But of course, we need also a European pillar, not in the least way, but of course the EU has to advance its capabilities in order to help NATO to become more effective, but also in order to uh, cover areas where, the, where NATO cannot act, for example, when it comes to energy security. That's a role for the EU. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Maybe Jacob, could you shortly comment on the questions about the old arms? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this debate, why when Schultz say that he wants Ukraine to win, is one of the, from my perspective, less necessary gotcha moments. It's like, imagine that, you know, Schultz says tomorrow, I want Ukraine to win. Would this change the tenor in any way? So I don't think this is like, in a really, I think I find this one of the minor concentrations of what is really, really the important thing, because what do you, what do you mention this all, you know, deep interest in Ukraine being independent in, and there? I think it's not only shared by the German political class, but also if you look at the public opinion, it's there. You see overwhelming majorities for support, support of Ukraine. So I don't think this is that important. That having said, I mean, perhaps it makes a little sense that the world looks differently from Prague than it does from Berlin without those two necessarily, one of them being right and the other being wrong. You know, if you look at that, you know, for example, the diplomatic kind of means the countries have at disposal, right? You know, there is not, a, you know, Mr. Fiala doesn't face the temptation to talk to Putin because Putin, you know, is not interested in talking to Mr. Fiala or the prime ministers of smaller countries, right? So then we can discuss whether this makes sense to do that or not. But Germany and France, simply play on this bigger board when they consider, make considerations about escalation and things like that. Whether they judge them correctly, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know what Putin tells them and things like that. But perhaps this kind of all in support of Czechia for Ukraine, which I consider correct for the record, absolutely, absolutely correct. No reservations about that can also be contextualized as a function of what Czechia can actually do best in this. And I think our best card is just going full in. But I don't think that's necessarily the best card for Germany. Well, actually, if I may, just two sentences uh, to build on what we have just said and actually what uh, was uh, uh, first uh, said by Kyolov. Uh, of course, I admit, and this is me, you know, now assuming my private role. Uh, um, uh, of course, uh, the Czech Republic as a smaller country has a luxury of not, uh, you know, uh, being required to think about the overarching strategic uh, considerations such as the question of Ukraine being too successful to trigger escalation from Russia. Um, yes, uh, our role in Europe is different and because uh, we will in any, we know that anyway, this is not up to us to actually decide on these, you know, mega strategic, you know, issues. We can go, as you said, you know, full in uh, when it comes to our support to Ukraine. But of course, uh, I think we understand that uh, other countries have different responsibilities. Uh, or maybe sometimes we do not realize it and we should realize it, you know, more. Uh, because our sort of tendency is, okay, uh, yes, this is maybe a legitimate discussion about uh, about uh, escalation and what can actually lead to unacceptable escalation from uh, uh, on the part of Russia, but it's up to our American allies to deal with it and to take care of it. It's not our problem, you know. So yes, of course, that, that's that's that 
that's some that's an element that's a part of that whole debate sure okay. germany obviously being somewhere in in between and depends how you define germany's role on this you know axis you know stretching from the czech republic type countries all the way to us type countries mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you very much unfortunately we are running out of time uh, but i would like to give the opportunity to the people online to ask one question uh, and the people who are here uh, uh, at the embassy can maybe then later and ask our panelists uh, after the discussion so please pass the microphone to Felker. So I just think we do a question which was raised by one person invited by you calling and it's Petra Meyer and the question we kind of just discussed it but not in these words is what steps of peace building do you suggest? So it could be to all of you or one of you just comment on the question of peace building steps in the ongoing war. And please be so kind and keep it short. Thank you. So well well here's my you know here's my five point peace plan, right? Of course I don't have don't have one. Uh, but I mean at this at this stage I think it's I think it's fairly clear it's supporting Ukraine, right? You know, no peace can be can be can be done with you know in a war that is waged just on the territory of one country, that is waged in massively asymmetric manner in terms of the way how the warfare is conducted and where you clearly see that i mean the 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 objectives of the war parties are so different that this is not something in my opinion that can be at the present moment resolved by you know sending in the best scandinavian negotiator you can get your your hands on right so perhaps, you know, there was a, there was a fantastic phrase in German, uh, erst Faktum schaffen. So first, you know, things need to be changed on the ground. And then, you know, at certain point, you can probably start talking about peace when, when Ukraine is ready, obviously. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, do you want to also share some ideas, Mr. Boresh? Well, I'll be short. And by the way, Frankly, what do you expect uh, from me to say? My, well, my peace plan is uh, that the fascist aggression must be defeated and the perpetrators of the war crimes must be punished. That's my peace plan. <laughs> Very clear. Thank you. Um, I suppose the, uh, the end of shooting does not mean peace. So um, we should um, talk about or think about what comes the day after. So the old Rasmussen's uh, ideas about security guarantees, about making Ukraine robust and resilient, but also yeah, defensible in a way. That will be the huge subject in, in the future, I suppose. Mm -hmm. If I can just one word to that. Another unknown is what kind of Russia you know, will there be, and you know, it can be still with Putin on the, on the helm, but you know, from the outside, Russia has also changed quite profoundly over the course of the last months or at least two years, right? And that kind of determines, determines that as well, and that, that we don't know. I think also here it would be good to have a sort of early common effort to think about mm -hmm. what happens the day and the day after, and um, also what has to happen on NATO's eastern flank the day after, in the, because I think mm -hmm. there will be in, in countries like Germany there will be a certain relaxation after that. So the test, in many respects, will come afterwards. So um, also I think here the Czech voice in Germany could help because other countries from the region are a bit more difficult at the moment. So I'm looking forward to the speech of the Czech prime to a speech of the Czech prime minister in Berlin, uh, one similar to that of Radek Sikorsky, where he encourages Germany to do more for defense and that you are not afraid of uh, of the uh, German Sonderfamilie and of Germany meeting its defense spending goals. That is not a risk for Central Europe because some of these voices I heard also in this town, but that is good for the security and stability on the continent. Full agreement. 
<laughs> so that is a great present word. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Irish, uh, Jakob Eberle, Kai Olaf Lang, uh, for joining this discussion. Unfortunately, I have to cut it here and pass the floor to the second panel. But thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the evening. Another 45 minutes to go, and afterwards we will have a spa reception in the room uh, before this room. So I'm inviting the participants of the second panel to come to the stage. That's all Ja, Stop the pressure. This is an
So, welcome to the second part of this evening. We will start now the discussion. Okay, okay. Once again, welcome to, to the second part of this discussion. Uh, our topic now will be energy and energy security, because we live, as we have heard, in the times of securitization um, after the Russian invasion. And welcome not only to those here in the German embassy in Prague, but also to all those who are on the screens, invited by um, Charles University, invited by Europe Calling, or invited by the German Association for the Study of Eastern Europe. So welcome to all. I first uh, introduce our panelists, and then we right start the discussion. Uh, to my left, uh, Thomas Ehler, um, who is the Deputy Minister for trade and industry of the Czech Republic and um, kind of a special envoy for uh, nuclear power um, of the Czech state. Welcome. Um, yeah. Second, um, Andreas Rau, who is the uh, CEO of the company Natural Gas, and Natural Gas is the company which holds the license for um, gas transmission um, in uh, the Czech Republic. Okay. And last but not least, um, Christoph Hodewitz, who has been working for an even German think tank for focusing on renewables and in recent times for the Global Solutions Initiative, a initiative in the framework of G7 and G20. And now since some weeks, he's a kind of a freelancer um, and um, policy advisor um, for the solar industry. Welcome, Mr. Bertwins. So we already heard about the securitization of the energy policies or military policies as well, but also um, energy policies after Russia's invasion. And what I want to do in this panel are two sections. The first section, just to ask you to show us the picture right now in the electricity sector, in the Czech Republic, in Germany, and for the whole of Europe, and how the governments try to tackle the situation. And in the second section of our discussion, to look for uh, long-term strategies, which the governments of the Czech Republic and of Germany um, are deciding upon right now, but for the uh, electricity market and the gas market and the energy market as such in 10, 15, 20 years where the decisions are taken right now in the month and um, years uh, to come. So let's start uh, with uh, Thomas Eno and please give us a short description of the electricity market uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, which by nature has to be a broader picture because it's not an isolated market, but it's a, it's a European uh, market. Um, in early November uh, 22, um, what are the main features? Mm -hmm. So we make it two, two rounds. Away. Yes, yeah. Yeah, sure. So thank you very much for, for inviting. Uh, I had the privilege to be also one of the authors of the of the Europa band. So uh, I'm now in a little bit less comfortable position. I have to speak as a state official. So perhaps, but yeah, the same as my predecessor on this on this on this on this chair. Yeah, let, let, let's connect it to, with the current situation and Czech perspective and broad broad perspective. Uh, our state energy policy, despite being seven years old, has an important asset. And that's, I would call it, a true balance of three strategic goals of the energy policy. Competitiveness, security, and, and sustainability. That means that we have a quantifiable target in our, for our state energy policy, and that means generation adequacy. I'm now speaking about electricity generation, the gas we covered by, uh, by quick row. Uh, and uh, that means that 
long term long term perspective the Czech Republic is a net exporter of electricity that means it produces more than it consumes and I think this is one of the lessons learned despite being a bit uh, neglected of the current situation we need a responsibility also on the state level to despite having internal market but uh, to have at least 90 percent as as for example in the czech republic uh covered by the domestic domestic production so uh, in the czech republic today one third of electricity is produced in nuclear energy one third lignite uh 12 percent renewables eight percent gas and the rest uh, some marginal energy sources uh, but what we face on the electricity market today still is not lack of capacities uh in general we will go but the, the problem the problem of prices which is connected uh that's for perhaps points for discussion that's connected not only with a greater role of gas in price setting in so-called margin marginal uh marginal uh margin price curve uh but that's my point it's also connected with structural deficits on the supply side that means uh phasing out from stable energy sources and not having the replacement for for them to some extent is covered by special reserve for example in germany there is 10 12 gigawatt uh, in the winter reserve that would mean 12 tamarine uh, units uh, just for uh, just for periods where it's low uh, low uh, generation of uh, of uh, electricity especially from uh, not dispatchable renewable energy sources uh what's 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 important last point perhaps for the short short perspective uh, from our side we should be pragmatical we should touch upon both supply side generation but also uh to intervene into the prices uh now as as it is being despite being a liberal economist it's 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 necessary because the, it's regulated sector uh and it's deformed by a lot of uh, state intervention in the past so firstly we should focus on all potential sources of uh, electricity which can be which can stay on the market i mean especially especially the nuclear but also coal and ignite all sources which have lower marginal cost than the gas gas fired power plants because you lower the price you shift on the supply curve to the left uh, the equilibrium between supply and demand you lower the price of gas you have lower demand lower price and you lower the price the price of uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, co2 allowance it's that supply side the i think we should also be pragmatical about uets in the crisis in the war and that's also the position of the government which slowly evolved uh, we should freeze or cap uh, the ets really to help not not to uh, have the obligation or not, not to uh, or perhaps not not to be uh, not to intervene in the price setting and uh, not to have so much extensive uh, social measures on the on the right side of the equation let's 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 name it these are points for discussion thank you you already quite focused on the strategic questions and not on um, the actual situation um, which does not imply that there's no actual problem with electricity and electricity prices in the Czech Republic but perhaps we come back to the situation right now in the second round yeah. um, and I would like to ask um, to picture the situation with gas which is more traumatic um, for the Czech Republic as for Germany um, than the electricity situation so please Mr. Rao. Thank you maybe I'll, I'll start with a quick summary of, of uh, where we stand in terms of um, gas supplies, not only in, in the Czech Republic, but also in, in, in Europe. 
uh, in, in a nutshell, I think we can summarize the situation as better than expected. Um, so we've, we've been able to fill the gas storages in the European Union up to a level of 95%. That's um, exceeding, very much exceeding the target set by the European Commission for 1st of November, which is 80%. So we are, we are exceeding this target by far already, and, and this is good news. In the Czech Republic, the gas storage fill level is even a little higher than, than the European average. We, we've just reached 98%. And this is a good starting point for the winter season, but we always have to keep in mind that the storages by themselves are not sufficient to cover the, the winter demand throughout the whole winter season. The storages, the gas storages, can only supplement base load gas imports. That's important to keep in mind. On average, if, if the storages are full in, in Europe, they would probably be able to cover two months of winter demand, two months, maybe two and a half months of, of winter, winter demand, always assuming that we, we do not have an extra cold spell. The second element, which is all often forgotten in, in, in the public debate, is, is the fact that the what we call the withdrawal capacity from the storages. So the amount of gas you can extract from the storages decreases over time, which means at the end of the winter season, you, you cannot withdraw that much gas anymore from the storages. And, and this means the risky, the most risky point in time usually is in February or even early March. Still, I'm, I'm quite optimistic for this winter season. Um, I, I think if we do not have another external shock to the system, like, for example, an additional reduction of, of Russian gas deliveries, we're still getting gas from Russia through two, two corridors, through Ukraine and through the, the southern corridor, uh, through the Black Sea. Um, so, so unless there's there's another reduction, which I, I think would be an, an external shock again, unless there's there's no cold spell, and unless there is no unplanned maintenance, not not talking about any sabotage acts, of, of, of course. So, um, if if we are if we if if we don't have such external shocks, I think we will be able to survive the winter season. Uh, 2022, 2023. Um, but, and this, this is the, the big but, the, the, the next but one winter season, uh, 23, 24, will be more challenging. Mm -hmm. This is already clear from today's perspective. And there are two reasons for this, two main reasons. The first one is we, we will probably have less Russian gas supplies into Europe next year. This year we we are we will at, at the end of the year we will probably have seventy five to eighty BCM of Russian gas supplies pipeline gas plus LNG compared to one hundred fifty five we had in twenty twenty one. Next year, if we just extrapolate the current gas flows through Ukraine and through Turk Stream in in, in the Black Sea, we will probably just have twenty five BCM. Mm -hmm. So we'll be missing 35 BCM at least of Russian gas. These are European figures, not Czech figures. These are, these are European figures. Yeah, the Czech market That's is easy. relatively small compared, compared, compared to, to Germany, for example. Yep. So these are European figures. 35 BCM will probably be missing because of missing Russian gas supplies next year. And very likely the storages will be empty um, at the end of this winter season. Last year on first, uh, no, this year on 1st of April, we still had 25 BCM of gas in the storages. On 1st of April, 2023, I suppose we'll have less gas in the storages. And all in all, this means we need to, um, we need to replace another 50 to 60 BCM of gas by non-Russian sources. And this will be the big challenge for, for next year. This is what also the International Energy Agency just published um, some days ago. Mr. Purvis, 
what is the June situation in this picture? It's complex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so thank you for the invitation. Um, I will try to give you um, a picture in a nutshell. So currently Germany um, produces about 50% of its power from renewable energy. So this is mainly wind and solar, biomass, a little bit of hydro. Um, nuclear power has a share of about 10% right now. It's phased down, down um, by the end of spring. Um, gas about 15% and the rest is hard coal and lignite. Um, the target of uh, the federal government is to get to 80% of renewable energy by 2030. So this is quite ambitious. Um, and doing this mainly with wind and solar, meaning tripling wind energy, uh, tripling solar energy, and more than double wind energy. Um, other than you might expect, Right now, Germany is still exporting a lot of electricity. So France right now imports from Germany up to six gigawatt. So this is really a lot. This is, um, I would say, about uh, eight to 10 percent of uh, France demand. And also Czech, Czech is uh, importing from Germany. I looked up the numbers for today. So today it's uh, 1.4 gigawatt and I did a rule of some calculation. I think that's uh, about 15 to 20 percent of uh, Czech peak demand, and this is um, because renewable energy is are lowering the power prices in Germany. So whenever wind and the wind blows and the sun is shining, the power prices at the power um, exchange are decreasing a lot. So this is what you described as a merit as a merit order effect because mm -hmm. at this very time we do not need any gas-fired power plants anymore. So they are pushed out of the system when we have enough wind and sun. Um, so um, today, you know, the weather was a very sunny and also windy day, meaning that also in, in a, well, usually gray and cold November day to sort of German energy demand at noon, um, um, originated from renewable energies. So this is kind of the good news. So um, we have a reliable system. Power prices with renewable energy are quite low. We have ambitious targets. That's nice. If you And this is a long-term perspective. Sorry for about that, but uh, I think it's important to know. If you have a look on current energy policies and politics, the situation indeed is very complex because what I've told you is the long-term perspective so what we are aiming for and at the same time we are doing something like a tumble backwards we are jumping backwards we have um, despite our climate goals um, we have uh, prolonged the um, 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 the operating times of coal-fired power plants. We, Germany has prolonged um, the operation time of nuclear power plants. We are building LNG terminals, so investments in fossil energy infrastructure, something which the G7 two years ago excluded to do, is Germany doing right now, which is uh, I think a problem when it comes to international credibility. Um, but this is as we all know, a measure of last resort. It's to keep the energy system stable. Um, and um, of course, we're also talking to um, uh, countries like Qatar to uh, deliver LNG to Germany. And uh, we are talking to African countries to invest in gas infrastructure. So this is not compatible with our long-term um, targets, to be clear. but. Um, you, you, you mentioned the numbers we, uh, we need, the BCM, which needs to be imported via all those LNG terminals, and the LNG market is also um, sometimes complex and with, with lots of ups and downs, and I think, the, at least this is my interpretation, um, all these measures are to stabilize long-term gas prices um, for Germany, but since Germany is in the center, the hub for um, central and also um, uh, um, um, 
Southern Europe, uh, not Southern Europe, but uh, um, Austria and uh, Switzerland. Um, and those countries are also benefiting from that measures. So, um, because energy prices have um, uh, um, been on the rise a lot, also in Germany, we have a lot of uh, of, of uh, emergency measures to safeguard energy prices, um, which is also in a way a rollback from a liberalized power market into a more regulated power market. So something we tried to leave um, about 25 years ago uh, in Europe. So, and I will be very curious where this ends if we still have a power market over, let's say, two or three years. I, I think you, you can doubt that. And I think that's it in a nutshell. And I'm happy to discuss uh, your questions, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas Eller, as your first intervention was more focused on the long-term strategy, I would right now like to ask you, what is the strategy of the Czech Republic to tackle with the lack of gas um, and even electricity, as we have learned, um, even in November, not the last time for uh, energy, the Czech Republic is actually importing, not exporting um, electricity. So what is the short-term strategy to tackle this problem in the year to come, I would say? Okay, I thought I will now get to longer. <laughs> we'll go back to the perspective, but let's, let, let's combine it. Yeah, as for gas, we have to admit to ourselves, it's not possible to sub substitute Russian gas within one, perhaps two years. Yes, yes. Let's, let, let's be realistic. The Eastern Corridor is now uh, stopped. There is a reverse flow from EU to Ukraine, which is, uh, supporting Slovakia and Austria. So the strategy is, of course, as described by, by Mr. Rao. LNG uh, contracts, the contracts for from uh, other European or Central Asian sources, and important thing, lowering the consumption. So the eastern track is used for reversion flow to supply gas to Ukraine. The northern flow from Germany via Nord Stream is shut down. So it's. Okay. okay. It, oh, that's, 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 that, there is a lot of gas flowing still uh, via Germany. It's just not Russian gas anymore. Yeah, but it's not from the Nord Stream. No, it's not. It's not, not, it's of course not via Nord Stream. Yeah, it's, it's, it's via Green, uh, but not it's Norwegian gas. Uh, a lot of Norwegian gas, and uh, to some extent LNG arriving at the LNG terminals in the Netherlands and in Belgium. But as you said, um, we need Russian gas. It's again, it's LNG gas. You mean Russian LNG? No, 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 Russian LNG. That would be actually yeah. Well, let's see what will be on the market. Actually, what's important for us? We are a country without access to the sea. So, parallelly to negotiating contracts with different with different uh, potential suppliers, and that that is important to use as much as possible the unite uh, EU uh, bargaining power. The, let's call it joint purchases or joint bargaining. For us, it's important uh, to uh, enhance the the capacity from German LNG terminals could be used uh, all the pipelines from from Polish LNG terminals and also investing uh, directly to the LNG LNG infrastructure uh, on on place. Perhaps the, the second point uh, renewables imports export germany it's not easy 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 to say i think if you make it really simple and read out the statistics from from last year we imported uh, power or electricity or we imported more from germany than exported to germany in six months from march to august that means in the month when the renewables are pro producing, but in other months, 
we help to ensure not only generation adequacy in Germany, but also, for example, the frequency in southern Germany. So we try to have uh, perhaps more, more complex view on the problem to look not only on uh, simple metrics of, of, uh, of uh, levelized cost of electricity, generating in, in concrete energy and which is energy from energy sources but for us it's important and that's more mid long-term perspective uh, to see the system cost what what was the optimal optimal energy mix and uh, this is i think uh, compared to germany there is a number of economic technical studies that uh, the system based on nuclear energy and renewables it's more resilient, more robust, more flexible, and more cost effective, especially for countries such as Czechia with limited capacity factor, that means usage of renewable energy sources without having offshore offshore uh, wind parks, etc. But that, that will be perhaps more jump to the mid and long term. Would you like to add on the, uh, the strategy to tackle with the, the gas situation for 2000 for the next winter uh, season? Yeah, I think I think when when Tomas Nila was referring to to the fact that we cannot easily do without Russian gas um, in, within one or two years, I think you you were having the the average European picture in mind, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily yeah. uh, individual countries. Yeah, in zero now. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, we have imported um, a lot of LNG this year. Compared to last year, it's it's around about 40 BCM of additional LNG imports. It's in European figures. Again, European figures, the EU. I'm only talking about the EU. In the first 10 months of this year, the EU imported uh, an additional 40 BCM of LNG compared to 2021. And I think this is the, the right strategy also going forward. Uh, next year, a couple of LNG terminals will, will become operational in Germany. And then the supply situation will, will even Im improve a, a little bit. And then the second important aspect is, is gas savings or in general energy, energy savings. So yeah, I, I would like to add on on the best strategy to secure to secure um, generation uh, adequacy, um, the German way at least was not, as you know, to build new nuclear power plants because that would take ages, it is unbelievable, costly, and we have still a security issue. The German way was to build um, relatively cheap gas fire power plants, or well, that's. Um, the, the German way was maybe to build them to fill the gap whenever renewables are not able to produce. But it's it's very clearly that in winter times when there's no sun, there's no solar energy. So this is a no brain. And um, with wind, um, sometimes it's the same story. Um, so this might be at stake uh, at um, at stake uh, given the current gas situation. You might think, but in reality, only 15% of the gas demand in, in um, Germany is used for power production, and a big share of that 15% is even used for exporting energy. So, in reality, the gas demand is not that high. So, um, and it might be possible to 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 feed those gas fired power plants also in future because they only have very little um, operations hour per year so that's just the german way i know there are other ways um, but um, the studies i know try to deliver on the same goals you have the security of supply cost and sustainability and um, the results of those studies uh, I know from Germany are that uh, the gas option is the cheapest. And if you, uh, under all um, possible technologies we have right now, and if you are able to find cheaper technologies like uh, big scale storage, and um, today RWE announced a 220 megawatt storage facility in North Westphalia, 
effects are, or if you include flexibility of demand, which is incredible, is which is an incredible big source alone in southern Germany, it could substitute one or two um, nuclear power plants. Then the whole solution might become even cheaper while maintaining security of supply and sustainability. So that is the idea behind the German energy band. Um, and I still did not hear any argument which really um, puts that on st at stake. So, um, but I'm listening to you. Maybe I learned something new. If you want to comment on this right now, you can do that. Otherwise, I continue with a last question to you all before I open the floor. Okay, you don't want to comment on this? I can connect it with. Okay, so, okay. so uh, my impression is that we have a, a very high level of interdependency, Czech German interdependency, and a high level of cooperation. And if you will remember the first panel and go to the question, what about France? Uh, in German France cooperation, I see much concurrence on the um, um, the future of the gas um, import. Um, and from this panel, I learn here is a great will from both sides, regardless of different future strategies for cooperation, even uh, in these times of the Russian war against Ukraine, in the gas sector, in the electricity sector, because everybody is very aware of um, the benefits and these um, interdependence. So let's nevertheless try try to ask what this does mean for cooperation and conflict um, in the long term uh, strategy. As we have understood, the Czech Republic is heading for e even more nuclear power, or at least uh, keeping the level of nuclear power, and Germany um, wants to get a root of liquid coal nuclear power and Russian gas, so it's heading for 100% renewables in the mid term. Around 13 years. Yes. <laughs> are, these, are these strategies which are compatible now? Because nobody will ever do, as Mr. Yu said, teach the other side to do this or that, or are there still, or is there still much potential for conflict um, in these two different ways of uh, shaping the uh, energy mix in those European states? Thank you. Good, good question. It was not on the on the list before. No, just so before answering it, just a short reaction. I haven't seen any study for Germany which would compare the energy and the scenario of the new coalition treaty compared to real nuclear renewable in Germany. There's none of no, that, but tell you, I think Agora in the Gibbon 2014, there was one. Uh, but I, we have at least on the table the study by French TSO RTE, which shows it in numbers that the scenario based on nuclear new build is 10 billion euro cheaper in perspective of the, the whole system cost than 100% scenario based on renewables. And I think France has perhaps even more suitable conditions for renewables. And that's that's a realistic scenario. If everything goes wrong, such as, or goes wrong, if the nuclear new build has delays, such as for money and others, the difference would be still 12, uh, two, 2 billion. And, so that, that, and that study is from uh, now or from before the has a recent nuclear power plant? 2021. So, so before. So, so last year. Yes. Uh, but a number of studies, I think, yeah, would be perhaps, yeah, you, you know, and that, that's a bridge. The long term perspective, and then I go to back to compatibility or, or not. Um, I think now we are still in a comfortable situation. Germany has about 100 
gigawatt install capacity of conventional uh, power plants. Uh, the same for Czechia. We still both are to some extent stability anchors of the power systems. There are only eight or nine member states which produce more than consume. But uh, what is not optimistic is scenario 2030 and 2040. The middle perspective for adequation uh, forecast, which shows that the whole region in annual perspective will be will be deficit. We all will be import countries, but the question is from from where. So this is for us priority for for, for Czechia to tackle this and to speed up the nuclear new build, speed up renewables energy uh, rollout, and of course uh, to to be more energy efficient, but on the other hand, we count with consumption rise of about 30 to 50 terawatt hours a year. So almost doubling in uh, our electricity consumption 2050. So a huge challenge and therefore not only one new unit, but up to three large units should be decided next year and uh, also the new technologies like small modular reactors for power and heat generation to speak about heat sector that will be that would need another session uh compatibility we have been for long term with germany arm in arm the defenders of energy only market i still can remember the initiative of mr Bake 2014 15 uh, the energy only market too but it seems it's it's complicated. The, we are still country, one of these countries which has no capacity mechanisms, no payments, a part of market. We, we, we still don't need it. The Germans left the energy only market quite early. So that's that's one point. Of course, our energy concepts in power generation are to some extent in contradiction because of the energy mix according to article 194 treating functioning EU it's the national uh, measures or the national uh, thing but there is an investment framework in the EU which has an eminent uh, impact on the on the uh, market price static signals and new investment. And there I see objectively, we have to uh, now with market reform and to, with other EU energy policy reforms, we should, we should be, we should talk more. We should, I think there should be less ideology. There should be more pragmatism. We should focus more on the, on the ultimate goal that's reduction of CO2 emissions and ensuring security supply and our framework should be more technology neutral and there is I think there is a difference on one side Czechia it's technology neutral it's supporting both renewables and nuclear energy on the other hand the position of Germany it's we, we can have respect for that but on the on the EU level uh, there is still problem to set a true level playing field even after taxonomy it's big discrepancy between financing conditions support schemes etc for nuclear and renewables so my my perhaps wish at the end would be to find a joint goal joint approach and uh, to have this true level playing field for the conversation and securing the energy security with all carbon free zero carbon sources and th this is not easy i would like not to stick too much to the order and give now we will drive to christoph Budovitz and mr Rao has the closing word of this round before i open the floor i only wanted to mention that i indeed um i am skeptical about the energy only market because it's um heavily under discussion right now in brussels at the very time where it for the first time delivered a new project, new renewable energy projects with no subsidies. So that's what we are seeing right now in Germany. Big solar parks are built, being built without subsidies. Um, 
offshore wind parks are being built without subsidies. In fact, they are even paying to get permissions. Um, and that indeed is at stake when we talk about, um, well, fixing the energy only market. Um, at least that is something we have to consider very carefully. Um, yes, and um, uh, regarding nuclear, so I mean, uh, indeed, it is a, a wonderful CO2 uh, neutral option, but the time we have is very short. 2050, we need to, or 2045, in fact, we need to be carbon neutral and all nuclear power plant projects in the world are delayed and even more in Europe, let's have a look to Finland, they are building for more than 20 years um, a power plant, same in France. And when it comes to the small nuclear power plants, so the, 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 the modular reactors, they are not available right now. So maybe they will be 2030, something like this. And um, then we are not talking about um, mass production, then we will have early prototypes. And I've not seen any company, any private company who announced to invest in that, uh, or to invest in nuclear power plants. It's always with state subsidies or state support, at least for whatever reasons, be it, be it, be it uh, for um, maintaining a system or for military reasons, so always the state is involved. And when it comes to renewables, that's the situation we had over the last 20 years. And right now it's changing into, well, into a market system without uh, uh, state involvement. And I would really love to see that this situation is being maintained rather than to be rolled back into a, a more state regulated system. So let me sum it up. We have yeah. Sorry. heading strategies. But we have no ideological conflict. Everybody accepts the national way for the energy mix, but we have a competition on economic grounds because financing either nuclear power or renewables shapes the market. So there is a rational competition between both states or on the European level, but no ideological discussion on blaming or teaching or forcing, even forcing, trying to force the other to take our even Czech or German model. And this is quite different Again, as we, if we compare it to other bilateral uh, situations, again, um, if we compare it, um, it's quite constructive uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Rao, before I open the floor, um, gas has been called a broken uh, technology, which technology, um, which uh, already had the notion of phasing out when the bridge when it's not needed anymore, but the bridge was set up for 30 years, 40 years, with Russia's war against Ukraine and the cut of Russian gas, the cut off of Russian gas um, mean that this bridge is very much smaller and we see a phasing out of gas in five years, 10 years or not. Um, as, as I'm working in the gas industry, I have, to, I, have, I have to be a little more optimistic here. I, I think natural gas will still be a, a bridging technology for, for at least 10 years. And um, the, the, the challenge for us will indeed be to find new sources and to be less dependent on single gas sources. It's a little more difficult in the gas market compared to the electricity market, of course, because the market structure is an oligo oligopolistic structure. You only have a limited number of, of uh, gas producers in the world. And, and not, of, not all of them are our best friends, of course. But um, again, having a look at the Czech Republic and, and Germany, I think there's, there's one one common uh, task for both those countries. And, and this is uh, reducing the huge share of coal-fired power production. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you, you mentioned the, the, the share of renewables in, in Germany. In power production, it's indeed almost 50%. Um, Deutsche Handelsblatt has just published the, the figures for the first half of the year. So renewables accounting for roughly 50% of electricity production, but coal accounting for 31%. That's a lot. In the Czech Republic, it's still worse. In the Czech Republic, uh, it's round about 35 to 40%. This is the share of, of coal-fired power production in the overall electricity portfolio. And it's almost exclusively lignite. So from an environmental point of view, the, 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 the worst um, fossil fuel. And I think for both countries, the task is to replace in the next couple of years coal-fired power production to some extent in the Czech Republic or also heating, um, production of heat by, by gas-fired power production, but with a clear perspective um, from a technological point of view to switch later on from, from gas-fired power or heat production to hydrogen fired power or heat production. And the technology is very similar. So whenever we invest now into gas fired power or heat production, mm -hmm. we have to do it in a way that it's compatible with the hydrogen economy. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Many questions from the audience. Uh, good evening. Uh, I wanted to ask whether we should like take the given situation uh, maybe as like something as a final waiting call and instead of looking for the next despicable gas uh, dealing uh, state, we should like uh, do the, um, the switch from fossil fuels to uh, yeah, renewable energies and probably directed to the Czech uh, deputy minister. Uh, you spoke a lot about uh, nuclear power and uh, I think of uh, France also relying on nuclear power, but um, this year we saw that due to the droughts uh, to, uh, that came in France, uh, that is also not a very reliable technology, uh, despite even the yeah, waste we can't really deal with at this point. Is your question addressed to someone special or every speaker? <laughs> No, that, uh, the final point was just uh, maybe a bit special to the Czech Ministry, but the uh, question is to all, all of you whether we should take this at, as a waking call to uh, renewable energy. If I may, may, yeah, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'll start. Um, of course, ideally, we should switch to renewable uh, energies uh, as, as soon as possible. But in re reality, that's much more, more difficult. If you take power production, for example, you need this, what we call dispatchable power. So power production, which which you, you can guarantee each and every day, even when the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. In the absence of battery technologies, so in the absence of technologies to store electricity, unfortunately, we cannot fully rely on renewable um, uh, energies. For the time being, maybe in 10, 20 years, the situation will be different. First point. Second point. We, we are always focusing on electricity production, power production. Uh, and again, the German example, almost 50% is the share of renewables. If you look at the total primary uh, energy mm. consumption mm. in Germany, renewables account for less than 20%. Yes. So the, 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 the task for all of us, the challenge is huge, and it will take 10, 10 or 20 years. Um. I think we have more technology available than we think. Um, when it comes to storage, for instance, um, electric vehicles um, are rising their, um, their shares um, year by year. And then the most recent models um, have the, uh, are able to feed an electricity back to the grid. So, and if you combine all those cars, this is really a huge amount of storage. That's one second. You mentioned the gas fire power plants um, at the bridge and uh, that they are also suitable to um, fire hydrogen. The question now is where does the hydrogen come from? One option is to import hydrogen from elsewhere, which is um, 
I think um, the less favorable option. Second um, option is to produce hydrogen with excess wind and solar energy and to store that hydrogen in those currents which are being used right now to store gas. So then we would have that uh, kind of storage and all the studies, the long-term studies um, have that as a default option um, to safeguard uh, security of supply. Um, and one last word, when we have a look on um, primary energy consumption, we always are also looking on the inefficiency in our current power system. So if for Germany, I did that calculation, if we translate all power consumption in one year into hard coal, we would get a skyscraper eight kilometers high and with this was a um, surface area of 200 by 200 meters. So a Mount Everest high skyscraper. And about half of this skyscraper is inefficiency. It's the, it's, it's a fog, it's a cloud above the power plants. It's um, the exhaust of your cars. This is more than 50%. And electricity allows us, a renewable electricity allows us to reduce that inefficiency by 50%. So you would end up with a skyscraper, which is only four kilometers high, not eight. Um, and that's what we need to do. And then we are talking about heat pumps, we are talking about electric, uh, electrical, uh, electric vehicles, um, about better building insulation, and of course also about um, um, better industrial processes which are available right now. For instance, in the port of Rotterdam, there, currently there is uh, an electrical driven cracker being built a technology which we at Agova thought would be available 20 years from now on. So this is happening today. So there's a lot of technology available. Um, the big question is how to combine that, how to build a reliable system um, and how to make all those different elements to speak, to transact, to interact with each other. And then we are talking about digital, digitalization and smart meters um, and also new business model. And we are talking about European cooperation because everything will be much cheaper if you are able to transport and to trade power throughout the continent. And this is also a reason why we should stick to that energy only market and not to go back to a more nationalized power system, which are more of a closed shop. Um, so that would end up end in, 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 in higher prices and so on. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Just three points. Very good point. We are focused too much perhaps on the electricity market. This is only the third of fine energy consumption, typical. It's described by the commissions as typical, not fail, but a uh, problem at the beginning of an argument that too much concentrated on the strong band and not, not on the whole, whole picture. But I want to assure you the renewables are for our government the same priority as, as, as nuclear and energy, energy savings. But we have to stay realistic. According to Academy of Sciences studies, the maximum potential for wind in Czechia is 7 gigawatt install capacity, 24 for solar. That's maximum, which is uh, with having uh, public and uh, concerned uh, uh, villages and regions not always happy about the renewables. Uh, let's see whether it's realistic to reach these targets. Even with fulfilling these limits, we as together with Germany, most industrialized country in the countries in EU, it won't be sufficient to supplement the 10 gigawatt installed capacity only in power generation in the ignite. Therefore, therefore nuclear. And so I wouldn't agree with CIVIS that uh, you can build renewables without, without uh, energy subsidies. If we take 10 years back correlation, I did it in my uh, articles, uh, new, renewables, new builds, it's correlated to subsidies. As, ten, as, as, 10 years ago, as, yes. Today, not the, anymore. If you take the auction, auctions, in last auctions, the prices were even higher than 
one or two years ago, and it's con it's connected especially to uh, to the prices of land for photovoltaic. Of course, there are some few projects that could be exemptions or not not, not the majority, but uh, they do not cover the systemic cost of this dispatchability. But to be honest, it's it talks about okay in France there are now problems, but they are working on it. It is lessons learned for the whole nuclear industry, but uh, especially for the wind. If you take the first half of this year, one third lower output in wind energy. That's not controllable. So both renewables and nuclear cannot be too much dominant. It should be we call it smart smart mix. And so last point. Uh, our analysis for nuclear new build have been quite robust on uh, sufficient uh, capacity of, of, of water cooling by water. There is a question from the Europe calling audience, and the second question will be from you. Thank you. Uh, so I have a question from one of our online participants. Uh, it also tackles nuclear power why does the czech republic rely on nuclear power and not strongly on the development of renewable energy although the uranium still comes from russia yeah just for the first aspect we have we have covered in the last intervention mm. uh, our nuclear fuel is diversified our nuclear materials are not uh, major coming coming from from russia uh, of course, as for nuclear power plant Temelin, that is a contract for uh, for non-Russian fuel, so it's fully diversified. Among others, uh, one part will be uh, manufactured in Germany. Uh, and uh, as for Dukovany, we are 440 reactors. The older ones, uh, we are together with Westinghouse and with the European partners working on the alternative fuel. That's fuel manufacturing, and then you have also the it's quite complicated uh, uranium and which uranium. So the supply chain is to large extent globally, forty percent uh, in Russian hands. But uh, there are diversification uh, possible. I wouldn't say possibilities. There is a way to diversify. We are together with US and others working on that. So this is sort of a problem, and yeah, we have a strategic reserve on both sides. So it's it's not a problem. No. But it's 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 a matter of energy security for us. Important aspect as well. Thank you for the question. So the last question in the back row, and then okay. So uh, my name is Japan Vizi. I'm from the Center for Transport and Energy. And I would like to ask Mr. Eller, uh, because you mentioned the state energy policy, which will be also revised next year. And it's uh, also a question uh, aimed at the renewables, because uh, you mentioned that Czechia supports both renewables and nuclear, and none of them should become too uh, dominant. But when you look at the reality of the last 10 years, there was uh, very little progress when you look at the numbers of renewables. So. Uh, I was wondering whether this will be, what is your, how this will be reflected in the new uh, state energy policy and whether this new situation and, and, uh, and energy security is also an argument to, to be more ambitious uh, in this respect. Thank you. Show you answer, but just take one last question. Uh, yes, behind you, two rows behind you. Yeah. Just uh, thank you for the debate. It was really insightful. I'm Jeanette and I'm from European. I have many questions, but I needed to prioritize because of the time. Um, so first of all, critical minerals. We didn't talk about that much, but we are really relying on China. So I am really interested in your thoughts about it and how do you see the future? Is it more 
cooperative uh, situation or is it not that much? And the second question, which is coming to the point of that um, we actually politically banned the fracking in Europe. But on the other hand, what we can see on the ground is that actually we are supporting it by importing from the US. So what do you see about the fracking and why is it possible that we politically uh, somehow supporting the coal usage, but not supporting the fracking in Europe? So do we need to reopen this discussion in the EU or not? Thank you so much. So the first one was directed directed to you shortly, just to underpin or to cover what we have said with, with, with the facts. It has changed with this government on in many measures when you see now financing from modernization fund, national recovery plan and others, it's focused on uh, on uh, especially photovoltaic. It's focused uh, on new approaches like community energy uh, approaches. Uh, there is a change of uh, Energy Act uh, regarding uh, auctions. Yes, there has been some still stand, but uh, it was it was connected with overcompensation, with especially peaking 2010 and I was more academic than state official. I take it uh, with a theory of public choice as an external shock that worked at that time. And there was, uh, there was a correction of overcompensation policy. Of course, it has a negative uh, impact with that, with some uh, reluctance in coming years. But compared to other states, it was at that time to lower the overcompensation. We were in this aspect uh, more progressive than, for example, than the German ones. Sorry, it will be a new debate. So it's, it will be definitely reflected in state energy policy. It's not easy now to update a strategic document which you prepare two years and uh, if it's finished, uh, uh, the situation changes two or three times. If we take the last year, uh, war in Ukraine, the change of German government, the change of uh, German approach. Uh, one year ago, we thought that Germany would export uh, 50 or 60 terawatt hours of, of energy 2030. Now we see that Germany would be an electricity importer and hydrogen importer. So it's really, it will be, I expect, more dynamic document now uh, with short-term goals to be able to change. But uh, uh, as I mentioned, and if you would need concrete numbers as for renewables from these funds can, can, can send you our tens or hundreds of billion and uh, the number of measures, uh, uh, legislative amendments, speeding up of uh, permitting processes, special regime, et cetera. So I think it's, it's wholehearted for both. Okay, so the two questions are for you perhaps. Maybe you take the fracking, looks like gas. I'll take, I'll take this, this unpleasant question. But I think indeed, you're absolutely right. The, the discussion about fracking in Europe is a bit what I would what I would describe as hypocritical. Um, the US has become the, the largest single um, exporter of LNG, meaning in the end fracking gas into Europe for Europe, while we could probably also um, um, uh, increase gas production in, in, in Europe ourselves. Uh, may it be conventional gas production or may it be fracking? Uh, the technology is fairly safe, I would say. Um, but I would even, even argue we, we need to start a new debate about conventional gas production in, in Europe. And, and this is fortunately happening to some extent now in Germany, um, but, only, but only to some extent um, um, for, for, for production uh, to be, to be um, launched in, in the North Sea. The Netherlands are leading by example here. They, they have taken an investment decision already. So conventional gas production first, but, but um, I think we should also discuss fracking, absolutely. I'm going to take uh, the China question. 
Um, yes, we are heavily dependent on um, China when it comes to wind power, but even more on uh, solar power. Um, almost every single solar module, at least the solar cells, um, are coming from China right now. And um, they are quite good, very cheap, reliable, and so on. And in the past, we did not have any, any troubles when um, when it came to delivery and safety of delivery. But that might change indeed for political reasons, but also for uh, internal reasons uh, in, in, in China. Uh, China um, will absorb about 60% of the world solar production itself to fulfill their solar targets. So then basically 40% of the world solar production is left over for the rest of the world, while we have very ambitious solar targets uh, throughout Europe and also in the US and elsewhere in the world. So um, we absolutely need to overcome this dependency. And if you have a look on um, the most recent strategies on renewables and uh, European sovereignty um, and um, uh, and, and industry policy, you always will find um, statements, we need to bring back European wind and solar production. So this is really a matter of industry policy. Um, and um, some people are talking about a new European Airbus project. Um, and I think this might be really a good idea. Um, because we are deploying this technology, we have uh, developed it and we are paying for it. So why should we send all this money and all this knowledge um, back to China? So, and the, the pie is really big. So the Chinese will produce uh, solar modules, uh, modules anyway, and we can do the same and everybody is happy. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for this really, really interesting debate. You gave very much insights. One can't read in the papers every day, and it was not too technical on the other hand, understandable level for everybody. Um, my personally, I learned very much. Everybody who wants to read about the Czech strategy can read Thomas Ehlers' article in our book. For so Germany, you ask uh, Mr. Podovins personally, or you read Agora Zeit with um, Agora Energiewende <laughs> studies or Fraunhofer Institute studies. So. Um, Metrogas has also published on its website um, a future strategy permanently adapted, so the information is there, um, and my personal sum up, as I already said, is there is much, much room and need for cooperation. We must face that there is competition um, for funding of the different ways, um, but um, it's clear that it's not a, an ideological confrontation on the way those states in the European Union are heading for a kind of sustainable energy future. Thank you very much for this evening and closing word to Mr. Henderson. Yeah, thanks very much to the panelists. Again, thanks very much to the panelists, moderator, to the audience, to you for your questions, your attentions. I think this was a worthy round. I at least learned a lot. There are many complicated issues. I'm not quite sure that we are always so far apart. I think especially on Russia, there was a lot of things where we do things together. We may have different traditions where we come from, different perceptions, different philosophies sometimes. But again, as this energy, we are ruled by the will to do things together. And I think that came out of this discussion panel very clearly that there are no national solutions anymore, that we have to work together, be it on gas, be it on electricity, be it on a future Russia policy, which cannot be national, but has to be European. So what I see here is a good example of how we address things together, how we find solutions together, and how we think strategically together, because that is really important, as we mentioned during the first panel, not just reacting to things, but thinking ahead and thinking of the issues of tomorrow and already figuring out how we react to them. That's very helpful.
I think during one of the last questions already, the possible next topic for another meeting was mentioned China, of course. The Czech Republic has its own experiences with China, including Taiwan. We have our own. They come from a little bit different perspectives, but I think we share the same goal. And here the same is true. So we will have to find a European solution to that issue because there cannot be national solutions anymore. So thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to seeing you outside when we have the chance to have a glass of wine and have a little bit of food and continue to do the discussion or talk about other subjects as well. Thanks very much.